I want to preach to you today a message simply titled, The Power of the Gospel. The Power of the Gospel. And now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 5 through 10. And as we go there, I want to, again, I just want to, to just say thank you for everybody that came out yesterday and was part of the women's tea. We, we had a great time. My wife had a lot of people tell her as it was over with how this was one of the, the best things that, that came to in a long time. And, and I, just, I just believe that God is, is up to something. And I believe that he is going to show us his faithfulness and he is going to just do some crazy things within our midst and it's all because we have decided we're going to move past where we are and allow him to be who he is. Uh, the last little uh, comment that I have is if you are planning on going to youth camp, obviously youth camp is not until towards the end of July, but what we want to do is start getting the applications in. If you have a child that you're wanting to go to youth camp, there's applications out in the front. And if you're wanting to work youth camp, those applications are in the front also. All we need you to do is fill those out and turn them back into me. I have to sign off on them. Um, and we want to make sure that we have enough funds and we, we can get everybody down there. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. I believe that this camp is going to be a phenomenal camp and we're going to have a good time. Those of you that are visitors, we want to welcome you into our fellowship. I pray that you feel welcomed, and I pray that you feel that you have found a new home, and we always want you to know that our doors are open anytime. If you're traveling, and you're just here for a little bit, every time you come back to Baton Rouge, I want you to know that the doors are open, and you have a place with us, and we want to thank you. Home folks, let's give our visitors a round of applause. And I pray if you see somebody that you don't recognize, I want you to go up and shake their hands if they want you to shake their hands. Hug their necks if they want you to hug. And just let them know that you're glad that they're here and just find out if there's something you can do for them. And God is going to bless you for that. Now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to 1 Thessalonians 1. I say 5 through 10, but it's actually going to be 4 through 10. And this is what the Word of God says. It says, we know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were there with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all of the believers in Greece through Macedonia and Acadia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep telling are talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols and served the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you touch me and help me, Father God, bring forth the word that you placed in my heart help me lord not to hold anything back and help me not to add god i just want to speak your word because somebody here today needs to hear it god you have brought them in today for such a time as this for this word and i pray god that it goes forth it does not fall on deaf ears i pray lord god that your word will do is exactly what your word said that it will not return until you void but it will accomplish everything you purposed it to accomplish god we love you and we thank you in Christ's name, and the church said amen. Now, as you begin to look at 1 Thessalonians, you understand as we read the text that Paul wrote this letter. This is one of the first letters he wrote to the European Christians that was birthed out of a church he planted in that region. And this is one of the first letters he wrote. Paul preached in Thessalonica 
for about three weeks. You can go back to Acts chapter 17 and begin to read the story of when he's there. And for three solid weeks, he would preach the word of God. Three weeks he preached the word of God before he was ran out of town because of fear of his life. In those three weeks, a church was birthed with power, with signs and wonders. I want you to, to grasp that for just a moment. In three weeks, Paul preached the word of God. He preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And in three weeks, a church was birthed that was now making all kind of havoc over in that region. They're turning the, the societies upside down by the way they were living because of three weeks with Paul because he preached the gospel to them. You see, Thessalonica was what they call a port city. So there was a lot of traffic within this city. It's also the capital of Macedonia, which means we all understand that usually, outside of Louisiana, the capital is the biggest city of the state. For some reason, New Orleans is our biggest populated city that I know of. But the city is always where everything is going on. It has the most population, the most diversity, all of this going on. And this is where Paul went on his mission trip. He went to where they needed to hear. It was important to communicate. And it was an important route of trade, Thessalonica was. This letter reveals the power of the gospel. My title, The Power of of the gospel. This letter shows us the power of the gospel. You see, we have got a deluded mentality and understanding of what the gospel is. And I'm hoping to, to, to clear it up a little bit today, but I know I won't do a great job, but I'm going to do the best job that I can. You see, there is a power that comes from the gospel that cannot be imitated. There is a power that Paul knew from the gospel in his own life. It was the power of the gospel that is unmatched. And deep down inside the believer's heart, if they truly are honest with you, it is a power that we cannot explain. The power of the gospel is truly unexplainable because we begin to try to reason it out with our infinite or our, with our finite minds what God is doing. We cannot truly put to words the power of the gospel as we have experienced it. Oh, we can tell them where we were and share a testimony. But that's just a, a little bit of what we feel when we think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we begin to look at it, the gospel is love and it's mercy and it's grace. And it's encapsulated with the gospel. You cannot have the gospel of Jesus Christ without these three. You cannot preach the word of God without these three and it be the gospel. When you experience the gospel, the true gospel is freeing to the individual that accepts the gospel. It is not something that burdens you. It's not something that weighs you down. But it is something that frees you. It is the power of the gospel. Here we see the power of the gospel in full effect. Changing lives. And we understand now from this text that it is unstoppable. There is nothing that you can do to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing the enemy can do to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a power that is unmatched. It is a power that is unrivaled. It is a power that nobody can truly explain or grasp. Because it is a power of God through his word. You see, the gospel has been presented. I found this in my studies from a commentary. And it says, the message of Jesus Christ has power. It has power for miracles. Power for wonderful signs from God. And best of all, it has the power to change minds, hearts, and lives. It is the power of the message of Jesus Christ. You see... God gave us a preview of the gospel in Genesis. And I, I shared this scripture with you not too long ago. But you can go back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And this is the gospel as God previewed it to us way back then. 
The Bible says this, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Well, how is that the gospel? God is showing everybody right there in Genesis that the gospel is simply this. My son, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, is going to defeat the enemy of your soul. This is the gospel, the power of the gospel. And God put it way back at the very beginning of the book of his love letter as he gave it to us. It is the gospel, the preview. He's going to strike your head, enemy. He's going to destroy you. The gospel Paul entered a town filled with idols and filled with lost souls. I call it a town full of dead life. You ever been around that? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people alive. There's a lot of people doing this and doing that. There's all kind of commotion over here. There's lights over there. And there's all kind of activity going on. But it is surrounded by death. And as Paul walked in Thessalonica, he began to realize where he walked into. He understood that God was leading him there because there was a people that were bound up. And they needed the power of the gospel spoke to them. So he went to where there was dead life. The power of the gospel will compel you to move out from where you are. The power of the gospel does not let you sit still. This is the power of the gospel. And you say, well, pastor, I'm saved. I know Jesus. I've asked him into my heart, but I do not feel compelled to go do this. I do not feel compelled to go do that. We're going to get into that in just a moment because I'm telling you, the power of the gospel does not let you sit still. There is something burning on the inside of you that you have to share with somebody else. You're looking for a life that you can help. You're looking for a life that you can turn around. You're looking for some eyes that you can open to the power of God and let them see the Savior high and lift it up so he can change their life. This is the power of the gospel. Paul was not afraid. Even though his life, after the power of the gospel came in, was anything but a cakewalk. It seems like as soon as he... It, acknowledged Jesus Christ for who he was and began to experience the power of that gospel, the power of that good news. His life was turned upside down, and most people say for the worse because he started going through trials and tribulation that no other man has ever gone through. Uh, a man that, that he was shipwrecked, he was put in jail, he was beaten, he was this, he was that, he was left for dead. All because... The power of the gospel changed him. Well, well, Pastor, you're not convincing me to allow this power to come into my life. You're not convincing me, Pastor, that this is the right decision for me to make. But you have to understand what Paul went through. It is the power of this message and the confidence in what God has said and what God had already done that pushed his feet forward. You see, just like all of us, Paul knew who he was when he was Stopped by God. Paul knew what he was on, his, on the road to go. Nay, none of us. Now let's just be real for a second, right? None of us go to God with the intentions of not doing things that we have done before. Well, Pastor, you're kind of confusing me. You think about this. Most of us will come to church because our parents tell us to come to church. Most of us come to church because our spouse says, if you don't come to church, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. And so we all come to church because we don't want that, that, you know, that, that abuse going on in our lives. But do you realize that most of us, when we meet Jesus Christ, we're not looking for him. I want you to think back in your life for just a moment. We'll sidetrack for a second. Think back in your life. When Jesus Christ stopped you, you were not looking for him, but he stopped you in your tracks. And he's like, no, 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 because, because I came to church because I felt compelled and I wanted to get saved. I didn't ask you when you got saved in church. 
I'm talking about when you, when you met Jesus Christ because there was something that brought you into that church. There was, there was some activities going on in your life that, that you didn't want other people to understand and want other people to know. And in the process of all of that, Jesus showed up in your crowd. And he just stood there. And he drew you in because no matter what you did, you could not get him to turn his head in disgust. Because he knows who you are. Paul was on his road and he was ready to destroy some more Christians and Jesus Christ stopped him. You see, even in setbacks and losses, the gospel is still true. The gospel is still all powerful. It is still alive and it is still present. You see, the gospel is also spoken of in Luke chapter 2 verses 10 through 11. And it says, and the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Do you understand that when you read that into the King James, it says, I bring good tidings to you. When you look up the word tidings and you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter Chapter 1, you read where Paul wrote the gospel. Do you understand the gospel is a translation of that same word, good tidings? So whenever the Bible says good news, I bring you good news, the angel was really saying, I'm bringing you the gospel. I'm bringing, because the gospel is simply this. It is great news for any man or woman to hear and to experience. It is not a gospel of condemnation. It is not something that won't make you feel bad about yourself. But it is the good news that no matter who you are, where you are, what you have done. The good news is Jesus Christ is looking at you. Jesus Christ is reaching out to you. And Jesus Christ wants to change your life. Amen. It is the good news. No matter what you have done, you cannot make him run from you. No matter what failure you have had and experienced, it does not mean God has left you. He is still there wanting to show you the good news is you might have some setbacks, you might have some failures, but I am still here. I'm still going to give you strength. I'm still going to stand you up on solid ground. I am still the God sitting on the throne in heaven looking down at my children and said, I will defend them because they are mine. The good news is simply this. There is nothing you can ever do to make God look away. The good news, the gospel is the redeemer is here. The good news, his love is more powerful than your failures. The good news is he came looking for you. Back, back in, in, the, in Luke, when Jesus was laying in the manger, he came looking for you. When he went on to the cross and spread his arms out, he came looking for you. When you felt that tug in your heart today, Jesus Christ is still here looking for you, wanting to change your life and to give you strength and to let you know there is hope for victory in your life. He is here looking for you. He is wanting you to experience his power. He wants you to understand that he is here for you. The good news is you cannot do anything to make God love you more than he does right now. You see, we, we can't fathom that when we begin to think of God, no matter how, how spiritual and anointed, how smart, how many PhDs behind our name we have. We cannot fathom because our lives are built around what can I do to make them want me to stay around just a little bit more? What can I do to make them like me just a little bit more? And every time we think about God in our minds, we bring that same mentality to the relationship we have with him and we're asking what can I do to make him look at me more there is absolutely nothing you can do to get God to look your way any more than he has right now he gave his only begotten son because he looked your way and he saw that you needed him there is nothing that you can do that is more powerful or more genuine than to Jesus Christ stretching out his arms you cannot minister better. You cannot do this. You cannot outgive the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. You cannot do it. 
He is perfect and his love is perfect. The good news is your failures and your mess and your shortcomings, your missing at the mark will not make God love you less. I want you to let that sink in just a moment. You see, a lot of us take our Christian walk with God as a hierarchy. The more we do good, the higher we're up on the level, and then ever we do bad. Anybody ever remember, well, I know you young folk ain't going to know what I'm talking about, but there used to be a game on the Atari called Cubert. Anybody ever played Cubert? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, she played some Cubert. Yes, she did. She's playing Cubert right now over there in the gym. Yes, she is. Right, Cubert was this old ugly little thing that had a big long snout like a, a Sesame Street kid. And it was a pyramid, and you had to jump on the squares and change them colors. And, and then all of a sudden, Booger Man's coming, and I try to get you, and you had to go over them. And the higher you got up, the, the, you land on this square one time, it'd change, land on it again, it'd change again. And you had to get them all the same color, kind of like the, the first Rubik's Cube. We all know what the Rubik's Cube is. And see, uh, whenever Cubert got hit by one of the Booger Man's, what did he do? He fell off the pyramid. Start all over again. And see, so many of us, we look at our relationship with God. We look at our Christian stance with God. And when we make a mistake, we think that we have fell off the pyramid and we got to start all over at the very beginning, level one, our first life, and we got to build everything all the way back up. If that was the case, why did Jesus Christ give his life for us? He gave his life for us because he knows that we're going to fail. And the only way that we're ever going to overcome is through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. The only way we're ever going to get victory in anything in our life is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is him that's going to stand before us and is going to pick us up when we fall. I believe it's Mark chapter 9. The Bible talks about how there was a little boy that was demon-possessed. And the father says, every time... The demons come, they, they throw him down, they throw him into the fire. And your disciples can't do anything. Nobody can deliver him. And Jesus spoke to those demons, and those demons fled out of that little boy. And the Bible says that the little boy laid on the ground almost like he was dead. It's like Mark 9, 26, 27, something like that. And the Bible says Jesus went down with his right hand, and he picked up that little boy, and he helped him up until he could stand. That's exactly what he does with us. Every time we fail, every time we make a bad decision, every time we think that we are, we are past help and we're laying on the ground trying to give up, Jesus is there with his right hand, the hand of power, and he's picking us up and he's got a hold of us until our feet are under us and we have our bearings about ourselves and we're able to stand on our own strength. Only then does Jesus let us go. Well, see, we're like Cubert. We fall off the pyramid because we made the wrong move. The good news is, wherever you are, he sees you. The same declaration made in the fields by the angels was the same declaration Paul heard in Acts chapter 9. The same declaration that the Thessalonians heard as Paul and his associates came to share. God loves you as you are and will change you because of who he is. He loves you just like you are. And he's going to change you because of who he is. The gospel has nothing to do with you and everything to do with God. The gospel is what God has already done for you. Jesus spoke these same words. You can go to John chapter 17 and begin to read towards the end of the life of Jesus. And he began to talk to, to his father. He says, I've done everything that you said. I've given him every word that you told me to give. I'm praying that you hold them, Father. Jesus did nothing outside of what the Father asked. I, there's a quote from a book that I've been reading called The Gospel Revolution. And it says, in Christ, there is nothing I can do that will make you, God, love me more. And nothing I have done that makes you love me less. Well, Pastor, you just said that. And I want to say it again. I want you to understand that because this is where we are. There is nothing that I can do that will make you love me more. And there is absolutely nothing that I have already done 
that will make you love me less. You see, the gospel has to become personal. If it doesn't become personal, you do not have the gospel in you. The gospel is transformational. Paul knew this, and he took that transformational message of Jesus Christ to Thessalonica. Listen to verse 4 again. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. When Paul went there, he understood the gospel. He understood the people that he was going to see. And he writes here after the fact. But he writes here and says, God loves you and has chosen you. He knew what God was going to do with these people because he believed in the good news of Jesus Christ. He believed in the message. He believed God was going to change anybody that would allow. He knew this about them. But before they heard the gospel, but there is power of the gospel that Paul brought that turned that city upside down. The gospel will change you. The gospel will strengthen you. When Paul left Thessalonica, he only stayed briefly. But you have to understand that he left because of persecution. And as he left because of persecution, he understood the power that he was leaving behind. He wasn't afraid of what was going to happen. And, and, and that was led to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Yet again, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everybody who believes. To the Jews first, and then also the Greek. The power of the gospel is simply this. That whoever believes in Jesus Christ he is going to save and he is going to transform it's not because of what you have done it's not because of the sacraments that you've held holy and you've done this and done that it is because Jesus Christ gave his life and the message is simply this there is nothing you can do to make me come to you and there is nothing you can do to make me run I am here for the long haul I am here to stay because the good news is simply this I love you and I've given my life for you and there's nothing you can do to push me away you're not strong enough you're not bad enough you're not you're not ugly enough I am here because I love you and the gospel message is simply this the good news is I will never be alone I will never be by my side I will never be by myself but I'm always going to be right there in the presence of God because he said he will never leave us he will never forsake us and he is always going to fight the battle for us Y'all need to stop. Y'all making me sweat. It's the gospel, the good news that Jesus preached into every city he went into. Do you know that if you read the gospels, not once do you ever hear Jesus preaching a message that promoted himself? You don't believe me? Research it. He never preached a message that promoted himself. Everything he did was about the Father. It wasn't about his denomination. It wasn't about his church. It wasn't about his circle. It was about the Father. He was here on Father's business. And that's the only thing that he could do was the Father's business. He had no other interest in the world. He didn't want to be voted king. He didn't want to be voted president. He didn't want to have the, the fastest growing church in, in Israel. All he wanted to do was the Father's business. And this is what he did. The good news is this. We serve a Savior that gave his life because all he wanted to do to bring love and mercy from the Father into our lives. You see, this is the gospel, the good news that Jesus preached. Every synagogue he went into, one of my favorite verses that Jesus spoke was in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. As he quotes Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 61, it says, The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Jesus Christ walked into that synagogue. He opened up that scroll. And he said, this is why I have come. And as he did, he says, now the favor of the Lord is here. The only reason Jesus came was to set us free and to let us understand. 
understand what true life was all about. You might have life, but the Bible says that he gives us life and gives it to us more abundantly. He wants to do more in our lives than what we are doing right now. It is all the power of the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just words. Verse 5 says this, For when we brought the good news, it was not only in words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. The gospel is not declarations of faith. It's not proclamations of what you stand on. The gospel is not guardrails in your life so you don't do bad things. This is not the gospel. You have to understand what we have done, and we have done it innocently, some of us. We have changed the gospel for religion. We have changed the power of God for a man-made institution that has taken away all power and all freedom. And now it is something that is weighing us down, and we have to look, and we have to, to accomplish these things to have the power of God moving in our lives. But this is not the gospel. We have to understand the churches are weak right now. They are anemic right now because they are not living the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they're pushing a religion. And Thessalonica had religions. They had more religions than we can think of. And they had nothing but death with them. But I'm telling you, when you allow the power of God to come into you, when you allow the power of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be a part of your life, that religion gets pushed to the side. You don't care about that religion because the power of God is going to be moving the power of God is going to be showing you what it is to live according to his word you see we all don't want to say that because religion is good denominations are good let me tell you something I love the church of God I've been part of the church of God my whole life I have nothing against the church of God nothing against the declaration of faith matter of fact pretty soon we're going to be doing studies on what the declaration of faith is with the church of God some of us we don't know that but we have to understand that this is just something that we men have come around and said this is what we're going to build our fellowship on the declaration of faith the, the Southern Baptists they have a, a similar one the Presbyterians have a different one the Catholic Catholics have something else. Everybody has their own ways they're going to live, their own ways they're going to do. But I'm telling you, there is only one thing that's going to get you to heaven. It's not going to be the declaration of faith. It's not going to be what you proclaim. It's going to be the word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that's going to get you into eternity where the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to reside. And he's got a place for you. The Bible said that he is going away because his father has many homes and many houses and many rooms. And he is going to come back for you. The good news is simply this. The power of the gospel will free you and will lighten the load that you're trying to do. Religion is going to hold you down. Religion is going to condemn you. You're not good enough. You're not this. You committed that sin. That sin is this horrible. You can't do it. As a man speaks with with sin in his life. You see, the only thing different between me and you Is my ancestry. You don't have my DNA. I don't have your DNA. But every one of us have walked the same path. Every one of us have missed the mark of Jesus Christ. Every one of us have fallen short and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us has made mistake after mistake after mistake. And yet we're still standing here because the power of God says all you have to do is come back to me and I'm going to wipe you clean. And as I wipe you clean, you're going to have the strength to be able to stand up under any pressure, any failure. I'm not going to bring that back. It's as far as the east is from the west. I have cleansed you. You are now white as snow. I've covered you in my blood. And now you can go forward knowing that you are my child and I'm not going to throw it back in your face again the only time that comes back into your face is when you cannot let it go God ain't throwing it back to you the Bible says God doesn't lie the Bible says your sins as far as the east is from the west never to be remembered again so why would God bring it back up I'm going to go on I'm going to quit meddling The gospel is God's love directed towards a broken people before we even knew we were broke. I found this from Spurgeon. It says, everybody asked, why, what has happened to these Thessalonians? These people have broken their idols. 
They worship the one God. They trust in Jesus. They are no longer drunken, dishonest, impure, contentious. Everybody talked of what had taken place among these converted people. Oh, the conversions, plentiful, clear, singular, and manifest. That is so the word of God may sound out. Our converts are the best advertisements and arguments. We have to understand that this is the power of God. This just told you who the, power, who the Thessalonians were. They were drunkards. They were idol worshipers. They were contentious. They were bad people. But Paul walked in there for three weeks, gave them the good news of Jesus Christ, and now everybody was turned upside down, and they were walking. They didn't need an overseer. They didn't need this. They didn't need They were walking under the power of God because they opened up their hearts, and they allowed God to come in and say, God, you need to, you need to change everything that is me and make it all that is you. And when they did that, they turned the city upside down the same way God wants to do us. You, we have to, why are there not miracles, Pastor Jose, running rampant in the church of, of, of America. Why do we have to go uh, service after service after service before somebody else gets saved? Why is it? Because we have not given ourselves over to the power of the gospel and we're following religious law and we're doing this and we're doing that. But let me tell you something. When we turn back to the gospel, when we turn back to that power, when we turn back to that blood, when we turn back to that cross, we're going to begin to see the signs and wonders that follow the believers. They ain't out in front. They are following the believers. And the only signs and wonders that are going to follow are those that have given themselves over to the power of Jesus Christ and allowing him to change them. It is the gospel. It is the good news that nothing you can do could ever turn away. The church does not need another revival. Oh, and I've been talking about revival. Me and John talk about revival all the time, but the church don't need another revival. We don't need another growth strategy to build the church up. We don't need another cutting edge technology to make all the people ooh and awe of how we do this and how we do that. We got them all sounding good and we got them looking good. Everybody's pretty. Well, we're pretty. You need to do something with this faith right now so everybody don't run away. But we have to understand this is not what the church needs. The church doesn't need them. The church needs the gospel. The church needs the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The church needs to turn back to what made them here to begin with and that is the power of the word of God and when we turn back to the power of the word of God those miracles that we haven't seen in years are going to begin to happen it's not going to happen in church services we're going to walk up here to cut the grass and there's going to be miracles out on the lawn there's going to be miracles when we're sweeping the, the street there's going to be miracles when we're cleaning out the toilets because the power of God is not limited to two or three hours in a week the power of God is rampant because he is an almighty God God, an all-consuming God, and he wants us to experience him like never before. It is the power of God that we have to get back to. It is the word of God. We have to understand that we ain't all that. I know I ain't all that. I ain't worried about it. Y'all be making fun of me anyway, way I say pecan. I can't help it. Y'all can't spell or talk. P-A-C-A-N. Ain't no O in it. We're going to go on to the gospel. <laughs> the young Christians in Thessalonica saw the gospel in the lives of Paul and his entourage. You see, it's something when a man gets up here and begins to preach, or a woman gets up here and begins to preach, and they get a good word. You ever had those people that you just like watching because they can just preach? You know, they can get you going. You know, you're doing like this in your living room. You know, you, you get going good, and then you begin to read stuff online. You're like, they ain't really that good people. I don't know if I really want to listen to them anymore because they, they ain't living the life that they're preaching behind that desk. But you see, the Bible said that they saw, and they heard, and they saw Paul live in front of them. I'm going to jump ahead because we're, we're running out of time. Do you realize Acts chapter 17 was the planning of the church in Thessalonica? Acts chapter 17. Do you realize what happened in Acts chapter 16? There was a singing choir in a prison with shackles. 
You see, right before Paul went to Thessalonica, he was in prison with his buddy Silas. And they were, they were, they were head and armed in the shackle. And they couldn't do anything. And they began to sing hymns and begin to praise God. I don't, I've already said this before. I don't know how they could do it. Uh, I, I'm not that there yet. I guess I'm not that spiritual, but somebody put me in some shackles. I'm, when I get done with this, when I get out of the shackles, you better not be around because we're going to have some words. But Paul and Silas, they are in the shackles. And they begin singing hymns and singing praises to God. And said, you know what, God? I believe in the power of your good news I believe that good news has changed me I'm here for a reason I don't know I did not choose this but your good news says you're never going to leave me you're never going to forsake me everything you do is, is working out for my good I'm in this city shackles in this prison for good whatever God I'm going to praise you because you do not lie nor have you ever lied to me I'm going to begin to sing I might be singing off key I might be singing healing is here healing is here and I believe it healing Healing is here. Healing is here. And I receive it. And all of a sudden, they said they become a little quake. And all of a sudden, those shackles begin to fall. The doors begin to open. And Paul and Silas walks out. And people got saved past that. But it's all after that when everybody else would say, forget this. I'm going home. I'm going to plow my field. I'm going to milk my cows. And I'm staying right where I'm going to be. I ain't doing anything else for God. Because every time I go off with God and do something for God, he puts me in jail and puts me in shackles. And I'm tired of it. Paul said, no, there's a power that's living inside me. It's like Jeremiah. There's a fire inside these bones that I can't sit still no more. I can't do it. It's not going to let me sit down. I'm going to catch everything on fire. I'm going to Thessalonica where there's some dead people, and I'm going to show them there's a power living in me that I don't live in them, and I'm going to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And as he shared the good news of Jesus Christ, that little church began to grow and began to turn the whole city upside down. Outside of the prison, there was some singing, there was some praise, and there were some people that were saved, all because the power of the gospel cannot be stopped. I'm going to read this, Derek, if you want to come play. Uh, I'm out of breath, sorry. I got to start running again. I got to get some calisthenics going on. Luke chapter 14, verses 26. Jaden, I'm not sure if you've got this or not. The Bible says in the New Living Translation, and I use this translation on purpose, if you want to be my disciple, you must... By comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 27 says, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But I'm going to stop at the very first part of verse 28. Verse 28 says this, but... Don't begin unless you count the cost. Has a builder ever begun to build a house without counting the cost? Has a farmer ever begun to plant a, a garden without counting the cost and understanding what it's going to take? Jesus was saying right here, don't come lightly thinking that it's just something else, some other club you can join. This isn't just another club you can join. This isn't a social club. It isn't a family gathering. This is the place where we come so God can pour into our lives. This is the place that we can come so we can hear the word of God. You see, what we need is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. What we need is an outpouring of God's Spirit. What we need is some people ready to surrender their lives to Him, counting the cost before they come and saying, by comparison, I will hate everybody else Jesus, you're, you're the main thing that I want. I don't even love myself more than I love you. Because Jesus is saying this. If your mind is not that way, you will not finish the race. Every parent can say that's true. Because if we see anybody hurting our kids, you better watch out. That's all I can say. You better watch out. What if your child was the one that was pulling you away from God? What if your husband or your wife was the one pulling you away from God? 
By comparison, you must hate everyone else. Jesus is saying, you won't strengthen your life. You want redemption in your life? Give me your life. I promise you, nobody will take better care of your life than I will. Nobody will do you better than me. So y'all might not know this song that he's playing. This is a gorgeous song. Take me in. I want to go past the outer courts. I want to go into the holy place. You see, Pastor Jose, we can say a lot of our people, they say right there in the outer courts. They can see it. They can feel the vibrations of the praise. They can feel the vibrations of God all over the place. But they don't want to go in. And it's all because of what Luke 14, 26 says. You must hate everybody else by comparison. But I'm telling you, once you open up that curtain and you walk past that holy place, everything else does not matter anymore. Because the Bible says he works everything out for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. Everything in your life is going to work out good according to his plan according to what he wants in your life. Well, it's not working out good right now. I've got all these health problems. Everything is working out for the good of those who are called. Everything is working out good. Well, I don't really like this because of that and this. Everything is working out according to God's plan. And he's never going to leave you out.